next on Unsolved Mysteries. Dreams of stardom turn fatal when a small town girl tries to make it big in Hollywood. A Chicago man is sent to prison for fatally shooting a security guard. He says he was framed by members of a notorious street gang. In Cimarron, New Mexico, if you check into the St. James Hotel, do not ask for room 18. It's already occupied by a ghost. And a police chief dies during an attempted robbery. Then his killer escapes from prison. Perhaps there's someone watching who can help solve one of these cases, and maybe it's you. I'm Dennis Farina, so stick around. Chicago, Illinois. It's close to midnight on Chicago's notorious South Side, and Garrison Hester, a security guard, is on his way to work. He is shot twice at close range and dies almost instantly. Four days later, 20-year-old Steve Shores, who lives in the neighborhood, is arrested for the murder. He is later convicted and sentenced to 35 years in prison. I've been here for 10 years, and for me, the free world has been a dream that I've dreamed about living inside a nightmare. I never killed anybody in my life, and I did not kill Garrison Hester. I do know he received a fair trial. Wayne Meyer represented the state during the clemency phase of Steve's appeal process. You know, he's lied about almost every part of his life that I could look into, all those things I know. So knowing all those uh, without having been there, I'd say yes, uh, he is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Steve Shores claims that he was framed for the murder by the person who actually committed the crime, a man who belonged to a Chicago street gang known as the El Rukins. He says that he ended up behind bars because he wanted to protect his family from gang retaliation. At the time that Garrison Hester was murdered, the south side of Chicago was an urban war zone, plagued by drugs and heavily armed street gangs. The El Rukins was one of the most powerful. They were very bad guys. Everyone in the neighborhood was scared of them because if you open your mouth or you said too much, or if you seen something that you wasn't supposed to see, you would either end up in the morgue or in jail like my brother Steve. Steve Shores grew up on the South Side. He admits that he had at least one run-in with the police. But at 18, he joined the Army and was later honorably discharged. He returned to Chicago, got a job, and says that he did his best to stay out of trouble. I was dealing with the gang because I was living with in the neighborhood. And what I mean by dealing with the gang is that he went by the codes of the street, you know? If you saw something that didn't have nothing to do with you, then you didn't say nothing about it. Steve claims that one summer night, he and a friend were on their way home from the beach at Lake Michigan. Around midnight, they turned onto a street close to the El Rukin headquarters. Two gang members, known as Bo and Blood, were standing outside. At the same moment, Garrison Hester walked down the street from the opposite direction. What you are about to see is Steve's version of what happened next. We hear a shot, and I see a guy standing over a car and I see him bend down, and when he comes up, I hear another pop. 
The guy recognized me. He pointed at me, you know, like pointed at me hollering to the other guy on the other side of the street. And uh, I recognized him as being one of the guys from that game. Get him. Check him out. Check him out. I actually didn't see him kill anybody because I actually didn't see the body. But I don't think they knew that. The next day, Steve says he was confronted by blood and another gang member. How are you, Steve? Got my yeah. So this guy, he grabs me in the collar, you know, and he starts roughing me up a bit to try to make me know the seriousness of the issue. Remember what you saw yesterday? Yesterday? Yeah. No, I ain't seen nothing yet. I don't believe you. I'm gonna ask you one more time. I, didn't see nothing. I don't believe you. I don't believe you. He tells me that I if I say anything about what I saw, I'm gonna find myself in a morgue. How you doing? Acting on a tip, police picked up Steve three days later. Initially, he was told that he was brought in for failure to pay his child support. But Steve says that he was held for 72 hours and was questioned repeatedly about the murder of Garrison Hester. It was then that he made what he believes was a crucial mistake. He lied about being on Drexel at the time of the killing. I told the police that I was at home because I had went to the dentist, which I had went to the dentist. I got the teeth pulled and I was home all day, which wasn't the truth. I didn't tell anybody what I knew because I was afraid of telling anybody. I was afraid for my family. I was afraid for my life. While Steve was being questioned, Bo and Blood were also being interrogated as suspects in Garrison's murder. Both admitted that they had been at the scene and both claimed that Steve Shores was the killer. The court assigned Steve a public defender named Andrea Lyon. I'm going to be your attorney. Have a seat. He told me essentially what he had told the police, uh, that he was at home, uh, that he wasn't there, um, and that he didn't do it. He always told me he didn't do it, which I believed. She was just another person in the system to me, you know, and she was some person that, you know, I could, I felt I would trust with only enough information that, you know, whereas I wouldn't be harmed. And so I told her that I didn't do it, and I felt that it was enough and she felt it was enough to fight the case. Steve was charged with the murder, largely on the strength of Bo and Blood's sworn statements. But there was another witness, someone without gang ties and with no connection to Steve. Before any charges were filed, the witness was brought in to view a lineup of possible suspects. Sir, if you could, just take your time. Do you see anyone up here that you recognize? The witness gave a height and a weight and also described the person as a dark-skinned person. Steve is not dark-skinned. He's medium-complected. I don't recognize anybody up there. Sir, that night... I think it's very significant that the independent eyewitness did not pick out Steve um, and that his description did not match Steve either. I mean, I think those are very important because he had no axe to grind at all. He was a good Samaritan. He stopped to try to help. That's all. The description he gave did fit Steve Shores, and that's one of the reasons why the police picked him up. He saw him from about two or 300 feet away uh, in the dark and only his profile. I think that explains why he didn't identify Steve. Four months later, Steve Shores went on trial. His fate hinged on the prosecution's three primary witnesses, Bo, Blood, and one of their friends, a woman named Myra Sexton. Mr. Shores, your attorney has indicated that you want a bench trial. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. On the advice of his attorney, Steve requested a bench trial rather than a jury trial. That meant only the judge would hear the evidence and decide Steve's guilt or innocence. We took a bench trial because it was such an obvious winner for the defense, it seemed, and because the wisdom at the time was you took a case that was really good for the defense to a bench uh, because you could skip some of the steps, some of the fluff that the prosecution would put on for a jury to impress them um, and just sort of get to the heart of the matter. All right, Mr. Prosecutor, let's begin. Steve was so terrified of the gang members that even as the trial got underway, he still had not told his lawyer what really happened. She still believed 
that he had been at home recovering from dental work when the murder occurred. I felt that it would be all over with once everybody got on the stand and said their stuff. You know, it would be all over with and I would go home. I always felt that. Everybody told me that as well, you know. Now, did you see the security guard? Yes. On the first day of the trial, Bo was called to the stand. Yes, after you saw the security guard. What happened? The security guard was walking. Steve said, I'm fitting to kill this chump. The testimony of the two eyewitnesses consisted of saying they were out on the scene uh, that evening with Steve Shore. They were drinking liquor, smoking marijuana, when Steve decided to run across the street to the security guard and stick him up. I'm getting tired of this kid. What, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> shots went off. Did you see the two shots go off? Yeah, I heard them. Who fired the shots? Steve fired the shots. Steve fired the shots. Did you see Steve fire the shots? Yes. Bo was an extremely biased witness. He admitted that he'd been told he'd get charged if he didn't name Steve as having done this. So he had a, an axe to grind. He didn't want to get charged with murder. Now, what happened when Steve ran up behind the security guard? He fired twice. When the other gang member named Blood testified, it appeared Steve was one step closer to being convicted of murder. Next, Steve Shores finally decides to tell his story when Bo allegedly threatens his family. Shut up! Shut up! Did Steve Shores murder Garrison Hester? At Steve's trial, two members of the Al Rukin Street Gang said yes. When the prosecution called a third witness, Steve's prospects got even worse. Now, calling your attention to that night, do you remember where you were? Yes. After the murder, Myra Sexton, a friend of Bow and Blood's, was also brought in for questioning. In court, Sexton claimed that she saw Steve three hours before the killing holding a gun in an angry mood. Did anything happen as you were standing there that night? Well, Steve and his dude got into a little argument, words, whatever. Well, this, this guy said something to Steve, and it made him mad. And the next thing I know, he had a gun out. Uh, who had a gun out? Steve. She called down to Steve and told him to come up to her apartment. Uh, he did go up to the apartment. Uh, she talked to him. She tried to get him to give her the gun. He refused, but he did calm down, and he went back out there. She did not claim to have seen the, the, the murder itself, but she was the only corroboration for this incredible tale that these gang members told. Steve's family claims that Bo and another gang member came to their home and threatened them. Get out of here! Hey, listen, be quiet! Phyllis! Hey, get out of here! Now listen, shut up! Phyllis! Shut up! Listen, now you tell Steve to keep his mouth shut, or else I'm gonna kill all y'all! Bo said, tell your brother Steve if he tell what he's seen, we'd kill all you mother effers. Now it's our turn. Steve says that he was feeling intense pressure both from inside and outside the courtroom. So he decided to tell his lawyer the truth. They all lying, all of them, they all lying. I know they're lying and we're gonna prove they're lying. Don't worry uh, about it. You don't me. understand though, see? I know they're lying because I saw what happened. I finally understood why Bo and Blood were lying. Steve was framed for a crime he saw. We've got to put you on the stand. Look, 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 look I, don't, I don't want to testify, all right? I told you before. I don't well, I know, but I... He was afraid that they come after his family again. So I said, don't testify. You don't have to testify. The state's case will fall of its own weight. They're contradicting each other all over the place. That guy, Bo, I mean, he might as well have confessed to murder the way he looked and acted on the stand. You don't have to testify, and you don't have to put your family at risk. I didn't push him to testify. After two weeks, the judge delivered his verdict. The court heard the evidence in the matter. There is a finding of guilty. I think I was more so angry than I was shocked. This guy could actually say guilty on me, you know, of something that 
he had to know I didn't do. Sentencing is scheduled for February 15th. I lost because I made a mistake. I lost because I waived jury, and I didn't think Steve needed to testify. But I can't blame anyone but myself. Steve listened to me. He relied on my uh, advice. He relied on my expertise, and I told him to do the wrong thing. Something silver, big, and it was in his hand. Within a few weeks, Andrea asked the judge to allow Steve to testify under oath. Even though the trial was over, the judge agreed. Would you tell the judge who he was? Steve, you have to do it. It was both. Did you shoot Garrison Hester? No. I didn't shoot nobody with no gun. After he realized that uh, he was found guilty and he better do something, Steve finally did testify. The I was at home with a toothache story wasn't going to fly because he knew independent witnesses, uh, a female, put him on that scene at some time during the day. I think he realized he had to put himself at least on the scene, but instead of being the shooter, he said uh, that uh, he was just a witness. And also, from when I learned about Steve, it's highly doubtful uh, Steve spends his leisure time bicycling around the neighborhood. But I think anybody would be a little cynical that someone would sit there through a whole trial, see the real killer, testify and name him, and just say nothing. I want the record to reflect that I believe the state's eyewitnesses. I still believe them. The judge refused to reconsider his verdict, despite supporting testimony from the friend who had been with Steve that night. Steve Shores was sentenced to 35 years in prison. The conviction stands. Your honors. Andrea Lyon appealed immediately. Steve's request for a new trial was rejected by a two to one vote. However, he did find an advocate, the dissenting judge, Eugene Pincham. The big hole, I suggest, is the fact that that was an eyewitness. If you'd have been a lineup, i have never seen the man before in my life, and the description he gave of the assailant did not fit Steve Shore. That's the big hole. The little hole is that all three of them, the two eyewitnesses and this person who was supposed to have seen Steve with a gun, were in the police station interrogated for seven, eight hours, had an adequate opportunity to concoct their story to fit the facts as they knew them. They simply substituted Steve Shaw for themselves. Did you say there are a lot of gang members in your neighborhood? Two years later, hope emerged. Myra Sexton, who had testified that she saw Steve with a gun, on the night of the murder, admitted that she had lied on the stand. We spoke to Myra, and her testimony did an about face. All of a sudden, there was no confrontation. All of a sudden, there was no attempt to get a gun from Steve. All of a sudden, Steve never had a gun. All of a sudden, it wasn't at night, it was in the morning. All of a sudden, the whole thing she said was a lie. It's not asking too much to say to the trial judge and to the prosecutor, try the case again. I let 12 people hear this case from beginning to end, from the date of the commission of the offense up until this moment, all material pertinent evidence, and there's no question in my judgment that a jury would acquit him. If we were to retry him, uh, other prisoners would say, well, why don't I get a retrial? There's nothing special about this case. There's really not. The only thing special is publicity. Despite Myra's admission, Steve was denied a new trial. Less than a year after Steve went to prison, one of his sisters was murdered. He believes that she was killed by the El Rukens street gang. While Steve spent the next 13 years behind bars, Andrea, at her own expense, looked for evidence that would get Steve a new trial. I'm hoping that someone who saw this, and I know people saw it, that someone will feel safe enough to say that they saw it and that it wasn't Steve. I'm hoping to crack the silence and find some new piece of evidence because I can't bear the thought that an innocent person is going to spend another decade in jail. Update. Andrea Lyons' hard work paid off. Steve Shore's third appeal produced further evidence of his innocence. The defense found one witness who admitted lying and another with new information. Steve entered an Alfred plea, 
which means that he pleaded guilty but denied committing the crime. Steve Shores was finally released after nearly 15 years in prison. Next, does the ghost of an angry poker player haunt room 18 in the St. James Hotel? For most of us, Halloween comes only once a year. But at the St. James Hotel in New Mexico, Halloween happens nearly every day. According to many, this old hotel is haunted by spirits of the Wild West. When I bought the hotel, I didn't believe in ghosts at all. Now, after the convincing evidence of the last five years, I'm certain that there are ghosts here. In its heyday, the St. James Hotel offered good food, attractive dancing girls, and comfortable beds for such Wild West guests as Jesse James, Pat Masterson, Annie Oakley, Doc Holliday, and Wyatt Earp. But as the glory days of the Old West faded, the hotel started to fall apart. Ed Sitzberger and his wife, Pat, bought the St. James and started to bring it back to life. But they soon discovered that the hotel had a life of its own. I wanted to see how many leaks were in the old hotel, and so I got my friend to come with me and to go through the hotel with her flashlight. We finished doing all the checking and put out some buckets here and there because we did have some leaks, and then we turned the chandelier off and then went downstairs and out the hotel, and for some reason I turned back up and looked back up to the second story, and the chandelier was on. I don't believe it. We gotta go back in. Sure, I turned this off. After the light came back on two more times, Pat tried to reason with the spirit. I don't know who you are or why you're here, but I'm tired and I really don't want to play tonight. I'm glad you're here, but could we please play another day? And at that point, I pulled the cord on the chandelier and heard a click, and we turned around and went back down the stairs, and I looked up, and indeed, the light had stayed off. Right. According to the Sitzbergers, the hotel was haunted top to bottom. Guests in room 17 have reported hearing a constant eerie tapping noise whenever the window is open. And Charlie Varela, a local high school student, discovered that he was not alone while cleaning the bar early one morning. It was kind of dark in there, and I was going to the back to get some liners for the trash. And as I was going back there, I just glanced over to the bar, and I seen a little boy sitting on the bar and spinning a glass. At first, you know, I thought it was a little boy from upstairs, and he was just down messing around, you know. I was going to tell him, you know, excuse me, you're not supposed to be in here. <clears throat> but when, <clears throat> when I went to make the move to tell him, he turned around. His face was hideous, and he just jumped off, and it just scared me, and it just took off. I quit that morning. I just when I seen that, it scared me, and I didn't want to work here anymore. Dr. Kenneth Wright, a surgeon and amateur ghost hunter, heard about the spirits at the St. James and decided to investigate. Let's go inside. The room was cold. And when I looked up in the upper left-hand corner, there was a whirling that was going on the corner. You couldn't see the corner of the room. It was like a white swirl. There was this anger and hatred, and instantly I was filled with terror. I was gasping for breath because I had not expected it, did not encounter it. I've never been that terrified in my life. And as this was happening to me, I heard Pat saying, You can go. You're free to go, you can go. I couldn't believe what was happening to me. I don't know what this swirling presence was. It didn't want me there. That was very obvious. Ed then contacted Jackie Littlejohn, a psychic from Albuquerque. 
I was able to sense physical violence or gunshot. It was so strong, I stepped backwards. I, I could see and feel and smell, and uh, you know, the, the evidence of violence was so intense. During her tour, Jackie claims that she had a vision of a deadly poker game. The poker game had been going on for a long time, and it was a feeling that either the hotel was a stake or a very large herd. According to Jackie, one of the card players was the man whose ghost now haunts room 18. He died of poisoning. Very slow, very painful, very dreadful. Desperate. Desperate man, very fearful. Jackie says that the dead man's name was T.J. Wright and that he probably won the hotel in a poker game just before he was killed. We wanted to look back in the records and corroborate the story, so we went back and looked at the hotel register in 1881 and found T.J. Wright registered three different days in 1881. It is reasonable to me that he believes he owns a hotel still and wants to maintain possession, or at least live here. Ed keeps the old registry locked in a glass case, and he is positive that Jackie never saw it. There is, of course, no way to prove that the ghost of T.J. Wright is now haunting room 18, but Ed is not taking any chances. There's no construction activity in that room or renovation work that's going to be done. That's his room as far as I'm concerned as a permanent resident for as long as I have the hotel. Is it possible that the St. James Hotel is haunted by the spirits of the Old West? The first-hand accounts you have just heard are definitely difficult to believe. But if you have a better explanation for what goes on in the old hotel, the owners of the St. James would certainly like to hear about it. Coming up, a young woman dreams of becoming a Hollywood movie star, but ends up dying under mysterious circumstances. For as long as she could remember, Crystal Spencer pictured herself as a famous Hollywood star. And yet her search for fame and fortune led only to frustration, failure, and death in a manner that has never been fully explained. Crystal Lene Spencer was raised in a small Northern California town. At 17, she dropped out of high school and took a job to help support the family. A short time later, she moved to Los Angeles to chase her dream. Her early years were a struggle, and Crystal quickly realized that stardom was not easy to come by. Crystal reluctantly took a job as an exotic dancer to pay her bills. On a good night, she took home up to $400 in tips, but she never fully accepted the fact that she was basically a stripper. Sometimes she would just start crying, like she felt degraded about herself, of what she'd done. One spring day, friends invited Crystal to a barbecue. She was eager to socialize with people who might help her with her acting career. I'm Anton. Nice to meet you. It's nice meeting you. Oh, this is your place then. This is your there was something very alluring and compelling about Crystal that would readily catch your eye. She knew that she would become not only an actress, but she would become a very famous actress. And it was just a matter of time. Anton Klein was an aspiring screenwriter and PhD candidate. He and Crystal came from totally different backgrounds, but they soon fell in love. Anton took it upon himself to help Crystal broaden her horizons. He introduced her to art galleries, museums, and concerts. She loved classical music. She loved fine art. She wanted to know more about these other wonderful things of life that she had never been exposed to before. Anton had absolutely no idea that Crystal worked as a stripper. She walked a fine line, discovering art and culture by day and working Hollywood's dark side by night. Crystal loved Anton very much. She was very scared about him finding out. She says, well, I better change. I better quit dancing then. 
before he finds out. Finally, four months after they met, Anton found out about Crystal's other life. A neighbor saw her dancing at the club by the airport where she worked. And he said, I saw that girl on stage. I said, no, you, you couldn't have. He said, that was her. Of course it was her. And I was shocked. He was very upset, but he said it was OK. He accepted it, which shocked her. And it, she didn't know what to say. One day, Crystal was homesick with the flu. Anton stopped by, and they talked about an offer she had received to work in Japan. So what's happened with Japan? <coughs> I don't know. Um, they haven't called yet. When are you leaving? I'm not even sure if I have the job or not yet. The next night, Crystal and Anton spoke on the phone, and Crystal said that she was feeling better. How are you doing? And the conversation lasted about 15 minutes. I said, I'll be in touch. And she said, OK. I hung up the phone. And that was the last time I ever spoke of her. Three days later, Anton tried to reach Crystal by phone, but kept getting a busy signal. An operator told him the receiver was off the hook. Oh, hey, hey, hey. Can I help you? Yeah, I'm looking for Crystal Spencer. She's not working tonight. Did she work here last night? She didn't punch in. Anton just assumed that Crystal had left for Japan without saying goodbye. I was expecting any day to receive a very excited phone call from Crystal saying, it's wonderful here. And instead, I got a phone call from the Burbank Police Department. Police discovered Crystal's decomposed body in her apartment. She appeared to have been dead for almost a week. They at first just said she was found dead in her apartment. And they wanted to know when I'd last seen her. And I said, I last saw her on Wednesday. And how was she? I said, well, she had a cold. And uh, they said they believed she died of natural causes. An autopsy revealed no traces of drugs or alcohol in Crystal's system. There were no obvious signs of foul play or suicide. The coroner ruled that her death was the result of undetermined causes. The body of Miss Spencer was in such an advanced state of decomposition, they were not able to ascribe the cause of death, uh, so they have no finding. I was suspicious because I did not believe that Crystal Spencer died of illness. When I last saw her, she was a young woman with a cold. I was suspicious because the way I was told the body was found in an obscure corner of her apartment, nude from the waist down, and I learned that neighbors had heard terrible screams coming from her apartment that some had described as the sounds of torture. Three days after Crystal had been homesick, two of her neighbors were woken up around 4 a.m. by a strange crying sound. Listen, do you hear that? But even before I even woke him up, I laid there thinking someone's being tortured, someone's being hurt, something's going on. Well, why don't we, why don't Susan was very animate about calling the police, but out of my fear of what I heard, I didn't want to get involved. I don't think I'll ever be able to live with the fact that I didn't call the police. If I had, maybe she would still be alive. Crystal's body was discovered a week after her neighbors heard the screams. They finally told their story to the police. He just took my statement, took my name, asked me for my driver's license, and that was it. It, it was just very nonchalant about it. Crystal's family requested to view the body several times, but the coroner's office continually refused, claiming the body was in no condition to be seen. Anton was denied access to the police reports. However, four months after Crystal's death, he was able to obtain the autopsy report. He was shocked by what he found. Crystal Spencer was barely five foot tall. The autopsy report claims that she's an amazing five foot seven. Crystal weighed approximately 105 pounds. The autopsy claims the body is a well-nourished 140 pounds. I, I was stunned. I said, this is not the body of Crystal Spencer. And where is the real body of Crystal Spencer? We do have the remains identified by fingerprints 
from two different agencies. And those really eliminate any possibility of the coroner's uh, autopsying the wrong remains. I was told by one law enforcement official, bad things happen to bad girls. And I said, you mean bad girls die of natural causes? And he said, you know what I mean, and hung up on me on the phone. Two weeks after Crystal's body was found, family and friends gathered for a private memorial service. Crystal's ashes were scattered beneath the famous Hollywood sign. I am angered that they are attempting to suppress the police reports in this case forever. We need to know what happened to her. It's important to all of us who cared about her to learn the truth. That's all we want is the truth. The truth about how Crystal Spencer died remains as elusive as her dreams of stardom. If you have any information about this case, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, an Oklahoma police chief is gunned down during a robbery, but his killer has been found, thanks to one of our viewers. Catoosa, Oklahoma. Just after 8 a.m. one September morning, two men pulled up in front of a tag agency, a popular target for thieves who deal in stolen cars. This is a robbery? Get down on the ground, lady. Don't look at me. We're being robbed. Call the police. Come on. Keep your head down. Don't look at me, lady. Do not look at me, lady. Don't hurt us. Please. Chief, there's a robbery in progress at the Catoosa Tag Agency. At least one employee inside. Out. 10-4. The only police officer in town was Chief J.B. Hamby, a 24-year veteran whose devotion to his work was well known. JB was on call all hours, no sleep. Come in, shower, change clothes, right back out. For those people that was on the wrong side of the law, he could become probably their worst nightmare. He was relentless. Hey, get out of here! Twenty rounds flew through that small store in just a few seconds. One robber was killed, shot in the head by his own ricocheting bullet. The other was hit twice, but somehow managed to escape. Miraculously, both women were unharmed. But Chief Hamby was not so lucky. He staggered outside, bleeding profusely. And JB attempted to reload his gun. And at that point, he probably sensed that he was, you know, gravely injured. And uh, from there, went right on in the laundry to get him help. He needed help. JB, JB, oh. it's all right. Call the ambulance. Repeat after me, JB. Stay with me. Uh, Our Father, uh, who art in heaven. <laughs> JB Hamby died before he could finish reciting the Lord's Prayer. The robber who escaped. 25-year-old David Gordon Smith was captured only two hours later while being treated for gunshot wounds at a nearby hospital. At first, Smith thought he was being arrested for armed robbery, but instead he was booked on charges of first-degree murder. Ballistics proved that the bullet that killed Chief Hamby had been fired from Smith's gun. David Gordon Smith was convicted of murder and began serving a life sentence in an Oklahoma prison. Smith was the classic good boy gone bad, the son of a respected university professor. This was his first and only brush with the law, and he set out to become a model prisoner. Smith was well liked by the staff that had to deal with him. He was also well liked by the other inmates. And as he served his time and as his years grew and his behavior was excellent, he was, uh, according to Oklahoma law, classified to a trustee status. And uh, his job at the time was to monitor equipment at our lake. Smith was assigned to live and work all alone at a small water pumping station. A prison guard checked up on him every hour. 
On three separate occasions, he was allowed unsupervised visits to his doctor's office. Smith even got married. I don't think there's any way, by any stretch of the imagination, that he deserved any sort of lenient treatment. I, I think it's unheard of. I think he should have got the death penalty. I think he should have got maximum, you know, hard time. Uh, I could have lived with that. For more than a year, Smith remained a model prisoner. But one day, when a prison guard stopped by for his regular 1 a.m. check, he discovered that Smith was missing. He probably walked from the room at the lake out to the nearest highway a mile or so away where Joe Beth, his wife, picked him up. They went into McAllister, which is a mile or so from the prison, and mailed two letters. We know that. Authorities learned that one week before the escape, Smith's wife closed her bank account, sold her furniture, and borrowed $1,000 from friends. She told the travel agent that she was going to Mexico. She never mentioned her husband. Four months later, David Gordon Smith was seen with a woman in Arkansas, just 90 miles from the prison. The authorities were alerted, but by the time they arrived, Smith had vanished. I want to see David Gordon Smith serve his time. I just think it's one of the most unjust things that could ever happen. JB lived his job as a police officer 24 hours a day. A very intense person that took his job extremely serious. That loss can never be filled, and I, I just don't think it's fair. Update. After we aired this story, authorities received the tip that Smith was working at a car dealership in Spearfish, South Dakota. He was using the name Gary Johnston, and he admitted that he had seen his story on Unsolved Mysteries. Smith was returned to prison with an extra four years added to his sentence for his escape. <laughs>